Horace Mann Bond, along with his wife, Julia, worked on a special project with the Julius Rosenwald Fund to bring attention to the realities of racial tensions in the South. This fund was started to focus efforts in Black and Southern education. The Bonds focused their efforts on this particular project in a rural community in Louisiana. In 1934, they traveled to Star Creek in the District of Washington Parish to observe and investigate the progress of the Black schools in the community. During these observations, they kept a journal diary of all the things they observed while living in Star Creek for a few short months. The Wilson family was more well off in comparison to the other black families in the Washington Parish. John Wilson was the patriarch of the family and was married to Tempe McGee. John and Tempe had nine children who helped with the work around the house. Washington Parish had a stock dipping ordinance which was the time for all cattle in the parish to be soaked in a pesticide to rid of ticks and mites. The ordinance was then enforced on those who owned cattle. On the morning of July 21st, the range rider of the parish came to the Wilson farmhouse to inquire about an old mule of theirs that had not been dipped yet. The mule had been dipped, but the range rider Joe McGee asserted that it had not. John Wilson was away from the home that morning and his oldest son Jerome became involved in a quarrel with McGee over the mule. Angered from the argument, McGee went to a white neighbor's house and phoned the sheriff's office. Chief Deputy Sheriff Delos Wood, Deputy Macaulay Kane, and a white citizen by the name of Brad Spears came to support McGee. The Wilson family was gathered on the porch of their home upon the return of McGee and his cohorts. Deputy Wood stepped up and told Jerome to come with him. The deputy had his weapon drawn while advancing on Jerome, causing Moisey, the younger brother of Jerome, to step in blocking the deputy and trying to take his gun. This brought on a scuffle and the deputy ended up shooting Moisey in the stomach. The deputy then went on to shoot at the other Wilson boys on the porch, including Jerome, causing Jerome to run into his house, grab a gun, and shoot from the window, killing Deputy Wood instantly. All of the Wilsons were subsequently jailed for the incident. Nine days later, on July 30, 1934, the trial of Jerome Wilson was held with a verdict of guilty following on August 1st. The Wilson family lawyer appealed the decision and was granted a new trial from the Supreme Court of Louisiana on the basis that Wilson was denied a fair and impartial trial. The retrial was set for January 11, 1935, but it would never happen. On the morning of January 11, eight men came into the jail where Jerome was being held and dragged him from the prison after beating and shooting him. They took his body and drove it near his home and left him in a ditch to be found the next day. The Bonds did not know the Wilson family personally, but had been staying in the area for some time now and had been shocked to learn of the lynching. Mrs. Bond was away visiting family in Nashville when she received the news of Jerome Wilson and was sure that she and her husband could not continue living in Star Creek for the fear of their own safety. Upon returning to Star Creek, the Bonds discussed the issue with a few of the friends they had made in the community. We cannot go back and live there. It's just not safe for us. But I had my friend Robert Park visit, and he's really interested to see where we've been living. I wrote many letters to him. I can't disappoint him. We are just so unprotected here, Horace. The small community is at the mercy of any impulse they see, to f see fit to take over and then do as they please because they are white. And what type of attention do you think it'll bring if you show up with a white man who is clearly from the north? Um, as many white friends we made within the parish, I don't see why there should be any harm going and going back and staying for ourselves if it would be worth to stay or leave. Good afternoon, Mrs. Barker. How are you today? <laughs> Julia, very nice to see you today. I am very well today. And yourself? Nice seeing you as well. And I'm well, thank you. How have things been lately? Oh, well, my uncle just passed recently, but he went, he went peacefully and our children love their Christmas gifts. Our holiday was a good one. Oh, that's great to hear. So, I'm guessing you've heard of the trouble we've had in these parts recently. Why, yes I have. It's actually the reason for this visit. You see, I wanted to know if it is safe to still be here, with the white folks being on edge. Oh, Julia, you need not worry at all. My husband says they ain't gonna bother you at all. Just keep out of town, buy what you need, and waste no time with them. Nobody ain't gonna hurt you. I'm so glad you are back. We were worried you guys wouldn't come back. Did 
you bring your pistol, Mrs. Bond? Pistol? No. Well, you will need it up here. They did a number on him. I seen his body the day they found it. It was pretty bad. It was awful. One side of his face was smashed in, and you could see the hole in his head. It was hard to tell it was him. Only thing that gave away was his mouth. His poor mother is speechless. Makes me know it, uh, makes me so nervous this thing was like. Mr. Barker, I must ask you a question. Who are about? You think, you think it'd be all right for us to come back? I think you would be fine to stay in Stalker Creek, but you must watch out for the colored pimps, who are likely to say things to the white man from you that you never said. There are some members of our race who are just untrustworthy. Horace and Julia left Star Creek and returned to New Orleans. They were still concerned for the remaining members of the Wilson family and their fate. Jerome's brother Luther was still in jail. His mother, Tempe, was freed on bond, but due to the events, her mind was unhinged from the shock, resulting in her being committed to a psychiatric ward at New Orleans Charity Hospital. The Bonds tried to help the Wilson family. They knew that they had family in the North, but dissuaded them to go there and just move to a farm outside of Washington Parish. To help them, Bond started to write his manuscript that would be featured in the Star Creek Papers. The royalties from the manuscript would go to John Wilson and a quarter would be donated to a memorial fund for Jerome Wilson. Luther Wilson would be released from jail an entire year later after the event. Bond would go on to be an advocate for the civil rights of African Americans and take a stand in the debate on the decision of Brown versus Board of Education and how slavery has held back African Americans. Here is our editor-in-chief of the Longines Chronoscope, Larry Lasser. Our distinguished guests for this evening are Dr. Rufus E. Clement, President of Atlanta University, and Dr. Horace M. Bond, President of Lincoln University. The first steps have now been taken on an upheaval in our educational system. The Supreme Court decision on non-segregation in our public schools has affected 17 states and the District of Columbia. Now our guests tonight are representative of the presidents of all the 31 Negro universities, and we'd like to ask them how this revolution in education is affecting them. And Dr. Clement, you represent a university in the South. Do you foresee a tremendous surge of uh, students in your university for higher education as a result of this decision? Yes, partly as a result of that and partly as a result of the great population surge which we are expecting. Children already born are in the world, are going to school, and in the next 10, 12 years, most of, many of these students will be in college. And the colleges which we represent will be needed along with the other good colleges in the nation to educate these children in the way of democratic living which we pride ourselves upon in America. Well, Dr. Bond, which do you think is, is more important, the segregation decision or this uh, surge in our population growth? Isn't it true that under the segregation decision more Negro students will be entering high school and then I suppose going on to college? Yes, and combined with that uh, there will be the uh, development of an equality in the percentages of Negroes attending high schools and colleges. There's now a lag, perhaps, of uh, 20 or 30 years over the percentages uh, apparent for Negroes in the South as compared to whites, and Southern whites as compared to Northern. And when these two uh, cumulative effects hit the high schools and colleges, uh, there will be an even greater expansion indicated for higher education in the South than in the East or the West, uh, to my opinion. Well, may I ask you, gentlemen, what is... Uh going to happen to your Negro universities. They're private universities, aren't they? They're all private. The 31 colleges in the United Negro College Fund are private. We started the fund, as you probably know, about 11 years ago in order to meet the needs of these private institutions uh, for current operating expenses, like all other private colleges, while we just had a difficult time getting enough money to keep our work at high level. All of these colleges are fully accredited. These students will be in school, Negro and other students, in school in America. We think and we know that these colleges, along with the other good colleges in the nation, will be needed to educate the young people who will want college and professional education in the years ahead of us. Well, nevertheless, Dr. Clement, uh, won't the economic forces make the uh, Negro student uh, rush to the state universities if they are non-racial after the decision really takes effect? Some of them will go and some of them ought to go. The private college is a sort of balance in a democracy, Mr. Lesseur. 
There are good many things that we can do. There's a, there are certain freedoms that we have that no state colleges, white or Negro, North or South, can have. And just as you need Harvard, I, Harvard, I think you'll need Fisk. Or just as you uh, will need the University of Chicago, I think you'll need Lincoln or Atlanta University or Morehouse or some of the other others. But actually, we will need to exist, and we will find monies from people, endowments, gifts, and friends who believe in private education. And that's one of the things we've been doing here in New York, interesting people in the continuation of good private colleges so that we can act still as a balance in a American democracy for educational purposes for all these people. Well, Dr. Bond, do you think that it is the uh, non-segregation ruling which will uh, start a tremendous ingress of students into the colleges, or will the old economic law still hold forth and uh, prevent uh, Negroes from entering uh, institutions of higher learning? They're bound to operate just as they have in the Northeast, uh, uh, where with uh, free admission, the uh, handicap of a uh, family with an average uh, income that is about one half that of the American average uh, acts as a very effective barrier to the uh, intrusion, as many people once feared, of a great many Negroes into many of the private colleges in the Northeastern states. I would like to say one thing, Rufus, about the necessity for private education in the South uh, uh, where the constraints of the state are even less likely to be uh, activated on the frontier of uh, liberal thinking, uh, which uh, to my mind indicates a, a very great need for the persistence of private foundations under the control of public-spirited citizens who are not under the constraints that political activity always uh, entails.